G'day everyone and welcome to Identifying and Describing Relations and Functions. Now if you've watched my previous video, yes I know it was about as bad as watching paint dry. Now by that I don't mean I was bad, hopefully I was pretty good, but the subject content was <gasps> cringeworthy and yawnworthy and I hate to tell you this, this video is not going to be much better. Which is a weird thing to open, bearing in mind I want you to watch it to the end. What I am going to say to you is that the content for the first three or four videos of this series will set you up for the learning for everything. And I can't tell you enough. Knowing the right language and knowing how to read functions and, and all the type of maths we're about to do and know that we're dealing with graphs will actually be about two thirds of this course. Get the language right and the rest of it is, is probably fairly repetitive. All right, so when I say language, what I'm saying is a number of my year 11s uh, get to the point where they go, well, uh, I don't know what a, a relation is, or I don't know what a domain or range is. Well, they're probably the biggest things in maths. Knowing what a domain and a range is, is absolutely massive. Knowing what an image and a pre-image is, knowing what a function is and how to read a function notation, know the difference between a relation and a function, and to be able to restrict a function is everything I'm going to deal with now. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you subscribed to my YouTube channel? No? If you would do me that honor, there is a red arrow pointing over there that hopefully you will take that time to do so. Very few people watch my channel. I do this for free. I do this for the joy of being uh, sort of in front of a camera. Um, I'm not getting any money from it, but it's nice to know that people are watching. So if you can just do me that honor of clicking that button, um, I would be deeply, deeply grateful. Now, there isn't much of a recap because the last lesson, as I say, was pretty much like watching paint dry. Lots and lots of language about sets and intervals and whatever else, but we're gonna build on it today. So, when I came to Australia, I thought I had found love, um, but apparently I'm doing it in completely the wrong way, as is evident behind me, because The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, and all those wonderful television programs where people honestly believe they are signing up for love and not Instagram fame or riches or obviously their own TV show, I'm way too cynical for this. I'm sure this lady or this gentleman, when they give them roses, absolutely believe that that is love they have found. Well, I hate to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, but that behind me is going, and maths has got it all sorted, because we've had love sorted for a long, long time. Well, actually, you know, we haven't. We've had relations sorted for a long, long time, and here is a relationship. Not very loving, is it? No, there's no roses, there's no hearts, but it is a relationship nonetheless. Why? Ah, oh, see what I did there, why? No, anyway, because when I have an X value, I can find a Y value, or vice versa. If I know a Y value, I can find a conjugate X value. So if I told you that we had an X value of three, I can put that into here, and Y would come out to be uh, 13. That is a relationship. I'm doing something to the X to give me a Y, and it shouldn't matter what value I put into that equation, I will always get a similar relationship happening. Not the same value, but a similar relationship. Now. When we put uh, coordinates in, we get what I say there is called a set of ordered pairs. More language, more stuff for Barry, and I've got to start using that hashtag, get rid of Barry, or no more Barry. I think that's gonna be the one we're gonna do. Hashtag no more Barry. Um, let's get that one going viral. Yeah, with my eight people I'm watching. Come on, we can do it, eight people. What would that be? I don't know, 200,000 posts each. Uh, okay, not worth the effort. When we put uh, values into a relation, we get an ordered pair. And you're gonna say, what on earth is an ordered pair? And I'm gonna say, well, don't rush me, it's there, if it's over there. Well, because an ordered pair, funny enough, is just a coordinate, yes, Barry. We call it a coordinate everywhere else in the world. Barry's like, well, can we just call it an ordered pair? Okay, whatever. Um, now, two other things you need to know is that while this is the X value and while this is a Y value, and a huge exam hint here, whenever they give you a coordinate, it is secret code for an X value and a Y value. And much of the maths you're gonna do in this particular course and probably all courses throughout the world relates very much to the idea of giving you coordinates, hoping that you won't twig that it's an X value and a Y value. Oh, math teachers are evil. <laughs> What you also need to know is that this X value here is called the pre-image and the Y value is called the image. And that sort of relates to the idea of when I look in a mirror, I am the object and what I see is the image. But again, do you see what happened there? Everything else we call me an object. Oh, I've been objectified. Anyway, I'm an object and what I see is my image. But now it seems to be I'm going to be the pre-image followed by the image. Now over here in Australia again, we have random things called pre-drinks. Don't even get me started on that. How can you have pre-drinks? Uh, comments below? Yep, not interested. 
One of the most important parts of maths for this particular video is understanding what a domain is and what a range is. Now, I know here in Australia, domain is a huge department store that sells furniture. I know, so random and nothing to do with maths. But I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller just so that we can fit this graph on. Here is the graph of y equals x squared. It's something we've met over and over again in previous years. It's a standard graph, and one that you have to know, I would say intimately, but that's not necessarily where I want to go with this particular graph. And what you'll notice is that I can put any value of x into this graph and any value of y would come out. Now by that I mean literally all values from infinity to minus infinity can go into this. No value won't work. I can put in 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 99.34, 0 0.876, minus 2,704. All of those values can be squared. And so when we're looking at the possible values of x or all possible values of x, that's what the domain is. And in this situation, scrolling up, going back to some really, really critical notation is this here. When we talk about domain in maths, and I know in year 11 it might have been written differently, but in year 12 and, and huge numbers of subjects throughout the world, we say that x is in all real values. Now again, if you haven't watched my previous video, please, please, please go back and watch it because it explains what a real value is. But for those of you who have not got the time to go back and watch paint dry, a real value is every number from minus infinity to infinity, including all decimals oh, to the nth degree. All right, so a real number. And that's very much what I was saying here. So all x values, which is my domain, are in the set of real numbers. So everything is possible to go in there. Now we can also write it in a different way. Again, this is interval notation. And what we're saying is x, my x values, my domain is in the values from minus infinity to infinity. Now notice the curve brackets, because if you remember from my previous video, infinity is more an, an idea. It's, it's a concept. It's not an actual number. We can't write down the physical size of infinity. We just invented it to make life a lot, lot easier for us. And also Buzz Light, you can turn around and say, to infinity and beyond. So using this interval notation is exactly the same as saying X is in all real values. Now, some people love this notation. Other people like the interval notation. Sometimes the questions will dictate what you need to do. Now, again, I say here, the domain is all possible x values that could be put into that equation. And I'll come back later to equations that are, it might not be possible. The range, funnily enough. Now, what is the range? It's the biggest value, take away the smallest value. Yes, that is in statistics. But here in functions and graphs, it's talking about all the y values that can be created from a function, or again, all the possible y values that might be created from all my possible x values. Now, if we go back to my graph here, if I scroll back up, sorry for those of you with motion sickness, what you'll notice with that graph is the y values go from zero and they just keep going up and up and up. Where to? Infinity, yeah, infinity, anyway. What you notice though, hopefully, is that that graph doesn't exist below the x-axis. So there are no negative y values for that particular graph. How do we describe this? Well, again, we can use two different notations. Firstly, our range is defined as f of x. And you've probably seen that before in methods one and two or other courses, because we can use f of x to be interchanged with y, a function of x and y are the same. So that's like saying my y values are in the set of positive real values. Again, if you don't understand that, watch my previous video. Or zero, not and zero, because you cannot have a number being zero and three. It's not possible. It has to be real numbers or positive real numbers or zero. So that, again, explains from that zero point and up also can be written using interval notation, all right? Again, now notice this situation, we have a square bracket. Why do we have a square bracket? Because it includes the zero value. Remember, anything that's a curved bracket cannot include the value, but because we're saying our range, our y values can be from zero and all the way up, we write the square bracket of zero to infinity, circular bracket for the infinity, and once again, f of x is in. Are you expected to do that in an exam? 
Oh yes, you are. You would have to write it that way. Now functions, functions, and more functions. Exams and everything you're about to do will expect you to understand the difference between a relation and a function. Now math is a huge trick. Basically, as I say here, please know that a relation is effectively every single equation under the sun. Every equation is a relation, yes? But a function is a subset of those relations. Functions are defined. Now we're gonna do the official definition first. They are defined such that for each x value, there is only one corresponding y value. And ladies and gentlemen, what I've said here is that y equals x squared, that graph of y equals x squared is a perfect example of a function because for every single x value, I only have one y value. However, if we look at this one over here, what is that function? Sorry, what is that relation? It's a circle. And see what I did there? It is so easy to just say function for everything. And my apologies if I get it wrong, it's preconditioning, but it's important when you do an exam to get it right. This relation is a circle. Now what happens is if I look at the value of two, my x value of two, I have a value here and here. There are actually two y values for that one value of x. And that says, therefore, it is not a function. It's a relation. Now, what I've just explained there in the sort of the way that I was looking at that circle gives you an indication of, well, how do you test whether something is a function or not a function? And lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, as I say down here, highlighting with the red arrow now, it's because the vertical line test. If I can draw a vertical line through a function, I suppose if I can draw a vertical line through all parts of a function, and it never crosses more than once, then it is a function. So as I'm just there with those green lines, which are probably hard to see, every time I did a vertical line, did it cross? It crossed just once. But if I do my circle, what do I notice? Every single where I go on that circle, even at the end, you could argue, will cross more than once, okay? So if it ever, at any point in the function, crosses more than once, here, I've done it again. If it ever crosses more than once in the relation, anywhere in that relation, it is just that, it's a relation, not a function. All right, so vertical line tests, awesome. Then we get to this concept of function notation. My first school in Australia uh, was fabulous and love, love, love the kids there. But the first sack they sat, yes, I know, you're watching this in the UK or America or India or anywhere else that you're watching this going, oh, did he say sack? <laughs> uh, yes, don't go there. Uh, Australia, love you to bits, but why do you call things the most strange things? But anyway, this SAC, which is a formal test, part of their examination, asked about 20 questions to be written in function notation. And no word of a lie, most of my group lost 20 marks because they had no understanding of what function notation is. So I'm going to reiterate here. Function notation has a very, very specific form, and that there is one perfect example. So the first thing we notice is F and the colon. Now that letter is used to describe my function. It can be any letter of the alphabet, but for most things you'll probably deal with, we deal with F, G, and H. I very rarely see functions in anything else, but they can change it up to try and confuse you, cause math is a big fat trick. So we've got the F and the colon, that describes my function. The minus four, comma four. Now we've already spoken about that in a previous video and now at the start of this one. That is interval notation. So what we now know is that that describes an interval from minus four to four, including both of those values. And as it turns out, the next thing after the colon is what stands for my domain. So that bit there, this minus four to four, talks about the possible values of x that I'm going to allow my function to have. So if I get to a point of having x equals five, it doesn't exist. My function is not gonna exist outside four. It might do in real world. It might be that I can actually genuinely put all sorts of values in, like that y equals x squared curve, for example. Remember, the y equals x squared curve has all possible x values, but I might not want to see all of it. I may turn around and say, well, actually, I'm only interested in a small part of it, and so I'm going to limit my domain. More on that coming in a moment. So then we have this arrow, which means it is mapped onto, and then we get this R. Now it's called the codomain. And I can promise you now, I have literally no idea what that means. Every time I'm ever asked, it's just uni maths. You'll learn about it in uni. 
If you can explain to me out there that you know what a codomain is, please leave a comment below. I can Google it, I know that. But what I'm saying is, can you put it in a way that everybody who is 17, 18, or 16 years of age can explain, then I would be deeply, deeply grateful. And I'll use it in my next video. But a codomain, just know that for methods three and four, methods one and two, it is always mapped onto double R. Then we have a comma. Then we have f of x equals x squared. So notice that letter f and that letter f are exactly the same. So what it's now saying is, my function is going to be drawn between minus 4 and 4, and it's going to be the graph of y equals x squared, or f of x equals x squared. This is just awesome. And I'm going to tell you now, you have to write your stuff in function notation. So let's look at this one. Here I have a function called g. And now my domain, that first thing after the colon is my domain, and it says real. So that means now my function, my graph is going to be valid for all values from minus infinity to infinity, is mapped onto real. My codomain is real. Okay, thanks. Moving on. We've got the comma. Then we're saying that g of x, g of x is the same as y equals 3 sine 2x plus 5 and 4 minus 2. Now again, methods 1 and 2. You should be able to look at that and go, okay, I know it's a sine curve. It's been stretched by 3. It's been compressed by 2. It's been shifted by pi on 8. Yes, if you get the, anyway, that's too much. And then shifted down by 2. If you don't know that by now, you have to go back and learn it because it's really, really important. Now, we can change the way we express functions because Barry is just loving this type of stuff. So these two are absolutely the same. If you don't understand what this means, you have to go back and have a look at it in the previous video or the Cambridge Essentials textbooks, which is what I'm currently teaching towards. But this x comma y is basically a set of ordered pairs. So a load of coordinates can be created using the graph y equals x squared such that x, my domain, fits between minus 4 and 4. Means exactly the same as a function f falling between minus 4 and 4, which is mapped onto, yeah, whatever, is the function y equals x squared. Why will they use these things? Literally to trick you. So you have to be able to look at each of those and understand what it means. Now, we're almost at the end, I promised. It is important in maths, much, much later on when we get to a topic called inverses, that we understand what it means to restrict a function. And I sort of mentioned it a little bit ago, whereby I may know that my graph of y equals x squared looks like that, but I may only be interested in a very, very small part of it. Why? Good question. Who knows? So we need to be able to say, uh, I know the function exists everywhere, but I only want a small part of it. And that's actually called restricting our function. Why would we restrict our function? Well, later on we have a subject, as I just said, they're called inverses. And for an inverse to have, uh, sorry, for a function to have an inverse, it has to be what we call a one-to-one -one function. Well, more language. So we already know that to work out whether something is a function, if I can draw a vertical line at all places through that function and it only crosses once, it is a function. A one-to-one -one function is basically, don't draw a vertical line, it has to pass not only the vertical line, but a horizontal line test as well. So if I draw a horizontal line through this, how many times does it cross? Two. And so that is not a one-to-one -one function. This situation here, that second graph, is a perfect example of a one-to-one -one function. Why? Because it's a function because I can draw a vertical line and it'll go through once, and I can draw a horizontal line and it'll go through once as well. So that's an example of a one-to-one -one function. You'll notice I have limited my domain between zero and four. So this could be written as f colon zero to four with the square brackets because I'm including both of those numbers. Do you know how I know from this graph I'm including both those numbers? Because I have a filled in circle at the end of both of those, uh, uh, my graph. Again, that's, that's really important. I'll come to that later. What else do I need to map it onto a real with a double line comma and then f of x is equal to x squared. So function notation, that's what is describing that particular graph there. We do more on one-to-one -one functions in the next video, I promise you. But it's critically, critically important that you understand not only how to restrict a function, how to restrict a domain, 
but why we are. Whoa, ladies and gentlemen, oh, he's done. That was awesome. There are no real examples for me to do because the examples are pretty much through uh, the work that I've explained. And so, ladies and gentlemen, here we are with a 45 second recap of this. And I'm doing it for Twitter. It's fabulous. Oh, and Instagram. So here we go. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, we were working with identifying and describing relations and functions, and we looked at relations and domains and range and images and pre-images. We looked a little bit at The Bachelor over here in Australia, and we decided there was a better way to find love because maths has relationships in buckets. We looked at ordered pairs and how they came into relationships before looking at the all-important domain, not the shopping centre over here in Australia, but the possible values of X. And we then moved on to look at the idea of range, which was the possible values of Y that would come out for my function. Wow, this got exciting. We moved on to functions, functions, and more functions, and we learned that a relationship was everything. A function had to pass the vertical line test. And then we moved on to a one-to-one -one function, which was a horizontal line test before knowing function notation was really, really important. And breathe. Ladies and gentlemen, I am done for this particular video. Thank you so much once again for watching. If you've made it this far, hopefully it's been useful. If it has been useful, can you leave a positive comment below? And if you haven't subscribed, can you do so? Oh, you don't know how? <laughs> There's a doohickey for you. Big circle, you can't miss it. Click it. You have clicked it, yeah? If not, wow, you are hard to please. There's another video loading over there for you to give it a chance. Hopefully I'm earning my stripes. This is the Mask Guru, signing off. I'll see you next time. Take care.